uh, uh, coding and I'll upload it to our YouTube um, as soon, like probably by tomorrow, if not tonight. All right. Okay, so in the next 10, 15 minutes, um, I'm going to talk about bias in machine learning models. And um, why as computer vision researchers and engineers, we care about that. And we try to do something about it. All right, so let's start with an example uh, to see when people are talking about bias in machine learning algorithms, what they're talking about. So in this example, say I've gone out, taken a uh, picture and I don't know the name of this animal. And I just remember there is a TensorFlow model that either I can use the web interface of it or download it and use in Python. And if I give the picture to this model, it would um, tell us what animal that is. So in this case, it correctly says it's a wallaby. And that's the uh, top matching image from that data set, uh, the training data set they have used, right? Now, that's great. Then I uh, go and take another picture of another animal. And uh, again, I'm wondering what animal that is. Um, I want to give it to the model and see the output of the model. Uh, well, it's probably a bit difficult to ask this uh, uh, here. I wanted to ask uh, uh, if anyone would like to guess what would the output, what would be the output of the model. Um, a hint is that is not going to get it correct. Um, so, you know, all those cat and dog videos sound like. So it says it's a cat, uh, which is obviously wrong. Uh, so we have two images of albino wallaby and one alibi, uh, wallaby. And then um, it, it seems even though they're the same view more or less, um, it got it wrong when it was a albino uh, wallaby. Uh, so maybe so that, maybe that's the view. Uh, let's take a photo of the same animal from another view from the side. And this time the model gets it right. Uh, shows us the correct, correct match. Uh, now uh, we go and take another photo. Here it's rather obvious to us what animal that is, <laughs> but um, so we wanted to test our model, we give it to the model. And probably you're going to guess what <laughs> is not going to get it right because uh, albino gorillas are just rare in the nature. So probably is very unlikely they have enough training images of that um, animal. And your guess would be correct. Um, no matter how many images from what view you show um, of this gorilla to the model, it never gets it right. So with that example in mind, we see that how the model does a perfect classification for some animals does an okay job sometimes for some animals and, and always gets it wrong for some other animals. So that kind of gives us an intuitive definition of uh, bias in uh, computer vision and machine learning models. So what we can do about that? Um, in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to talk about that. Um, from reading the literature and the recent research in this field, basically there are three steps that have emerged. And that's first understanding and the system that the training data is coming from. And that's the system also the model is going to most likely be integrated into. So we need to understand that system and the way to understand is to model it and all the variables and attributes in that model. Then after that, we need to come up with a way to measure the bias in a model. And we all know that what gets measured gets managed. So that's a necessary step. And uh, the third step, the final step is that, okay, now we have the tools, we need to go about and build our model 
um, with less bias or no bias at all. And all three turn out to be quite challenging. Um, all that is under, under active research. Um, so I'm going to just look at a few examples for each step. Um, and hopefully that kind of encourages people who are interested in this field. Um, I'm hoping that more people would be interested in uh, to take uh, analyzing and understanding bias in CV and ML models more seriously. So that, that's the question that why would we care about even that uh, as an engineer or as a researcher? Uh, to me personally, I think uh, uh, the best argument for that is that models that we develop could impact a large number of people because of how easy it is to deploy software at larger scale uh, versus if say you have a, you're a biased person um, as a single person, you are not going to impact that many people. And so hence uh, the importance of this um, topic that as engineers, we should take this more seriously. Um, so um, with that, uh, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to talk about a few examples of all those three steps um, in the literature, um, but all of those links are in a repository we have created public on GitHub. Uh, we call it awesome bias mitigation for algorithmic bias mitigation. Um, we have papers, talks, code, and so on. Um, list, uh, we will be more than happy if you find some um, research paper or talk uh, that you think is relevant. Um, please go ahead and either send it to us privately or even better uh, to create a pull request. And um, we are trying to keep this, uh, maintain this and uh, curate it. Um, so all the research engineers who are interested could um, uh, find this hopefully uh, a useful resource. All right, so let's talk about the first step. Uh, as we said, that's the system that most likely the training data is coming from and um, our model is going to be integrated into. Um, I found this talk by Henny Freud, um, probably one of the best um, examples for this. Uh, why do we need um, to start from there? So he talks about a model that uh, in the course in the US, um, they use um, uh, to decide on bail. And even though this model as an input, it doesn't have the ethnicity, uh, the um, ethnicity or race as a uh, variable, but it turns out to be a racist model. So he went about, he explains in this talk, how he went about reverse engineering that model to find out that there is another variable that is strongly correlated with race. And that correlation exists in the training data, in the data that has been collected in the system, from the system. And so hence, this hidden bias has been introduced into the system, into the model, and it might not be obvious when you look at the input and say, there's no way, there's no ethnicity or race in, uh, in the model, so there's no way to do that. But if you model the system, you see where that uh, uh, gets introduced, the bias gets introduced into the model. And so um, one of the recent, uh, a, a, a branch of work that is um, more recent is um, more in support of causal models. So, um, this uh, paper in Nature, I found it quite interesting. It's probably a good description of that um, approach um, and why. Uh, what are the benefits of such approach um, creating uh, causal models? Uh, so you don't rely only on um, correlation, but by understanding um, uh, the causal relationship between variables, you have a better model of the system and potential sources of bias. So here um, I have a um, kind of oversimplified example of that. I'm going to uh, briefly explain. 
say um, you're training a computer vision model, you already know image quality is uh, strongly correlated with accuracy of the model. Uh, so in the sense that if you give it uh, train your model with low quality images, um, the accuracy would not expect to do well. And uh, if you give it high image, uh, high image quality, um, then you would expect your training images are all are high quality, then the accuracy of the model is going to be better. So say you're, you have paid people to go take pictures of some objects, say their cars around the world, or their houses or some other object. And um, after you train your model, you see uh, there's some a strange correlation in the data that some images, it, it does just poorly for it. So for some regions, um, um, people images are taken in some certain region and they're just the model is doesn't do well for them and for some other regions it does much better so there's some kind of bias based on uh, region and then if you try to um, maybe and like as I said this is a, like a oversimplified model you see that okay I have asked people to take uh, images using their uh, cell phones and it turns out that um, in uh, some um, areas they might have lower quality cell phones, the images are taking on hands are uh, of lower quality, and then those are going negatively to impact the accuracy. So you see how that uh, understanding the system can help find the source of the bias in the model. Then um, this is all, the, the next step is even more challenging, um, and that's uh, coming up with a way to measure bias. Uh, so this example, um, these two equ equations, I briefly, uh, in a moment I will explain what they do. These are taken from a competition, a challenge in the European uh, Conference on Computer Vision, ECCV, um, a couple of uh, weeks ago. And um, so in a sense, these two algorithms, uh, two equations, what they do is that they measure the, the difference in accuracy between two groups of people based on some certain attribute and they define bias as that, the difference between, the maximum difference between two groups of people. So you find two groups of people who have the largest amount of um, accuracy um, difference between them for a certain attribute. So that could be, that certain attribute could be the skin color or a skin tone or um, age or gender. So um, of course, you would ask, uh, what is accuracy? Um, here in, in this particular case, they were using the area under curve. Um, but you, you get the sense that, okay, this is vague. Why do you, there are so many ar ar arbitrary um, decisions have been made to come up with such an equation? You, you might see some resemblance to transition gap, but still you see uh, that um, it's kind of uh, a, a subjective uh, metric. You, you could come up with uh, many other ways and that's, uh, there are lots of other papers that argue against even using this method. Um, and the last step is now, okay, you can measure it, you can model the system. Uh, how would you build a, a model uh, that uh, is less biased? And so this is representative of a um, class of um, approaches that they use Bayesian methods, apply Bayesian methods to deep neural networks. Uh, so to understand this, um, just look at that um, arrow uh, at the top left. So I'm, I'm just pointing, uh, showing a point that is very far from the orange and um, yellow points. Those are the training points. And the intensity of the blue color shows the confidence of the model. So a deep uh, network usually is very confident even at points that are very far from the uh, training points. And that's a bad thing. Um, that's one of the causes of uh, bias because you're uh, wrongly overconfident about a point that you should not be. Uh, so in this model, this approach, uh, after applying the vision methods, like you look at the same point that's far away from uh, any training point, and we see uh, now uh, correctly it assigns a very low confidence uh, point to that. So um, th this is an internal work. We are we have done um, several months ago, we worked on this, um, we came up with this approach. When we are, an, uh, so which is probably is interesting for people to see this. So when we are um, working on algorithms to reduce bias and so on, one of the approaches we use uh, is that training very um, simple models that the output or the embedding space is low dimensional, so we can visualize it. In this case, it's a two dimensional space. And when we are applying different methods, we can understand 
what's happening during the training process, uh, not after the fact that the training has stopped. So we can under, have a deeper understanding of the impact of uh, those methods that we are trying on the training process. And uh, to close uh, the presentation, I think uh, uh, I should share uh, three research questions and that I believe they are quite important and more people should work on this. Uh, and we are certainly working at uh, to face on these uh, problems. Um, will be different. And why I think these are important because if they are solved, there are solutions for them and everyone will benefit from them. So the first question is, how, is that even possible to measure the bias or evaluate a model, a model's bias without using any real data? So you just look at the, the model and uh, judge its bias or generalization. And why that's important is that um, uh, your test data it's, itself it could be biased, you know? And then, so if, if you just uh, don't rely on that, then you don't have that problem. And the second uh, question that, uh, we are interested in is, can we get to that, um, when the model gives us a confidence about a prediction, uh, can that be a true prediction, not overconfidence uh, about something that's completely wrong? So like the example I just showed, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done it's still there to perfect it. And the last and um, probably and the most interesting is this, um, can we have face recognition models as an example of other computer vision models that it, it's trained on images that are not face images or at, at least human face images. So <laughs> that's a very uh, interesting thing. Uh, we're working on it. And if that's, you see, if that's, um, that happens, if that's possible, then all the concerns about privacy and such, um, they are not there yet uh, anyway, uh, anymore. Um, so like the bios and so on, because uh, you're, you're saying basically that bias is coming through our training data, and if your training data, it doesn't it doesn't even have human faces, and then you can control that much easier. All right, so with that, um, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I don't know if we can answer. Go to the QA. Let me see, actually. Thanks, Musilam. Um Feel free to type any questions in the QA and. Um, I'll read them out loud. Uh, in the meantime, it seems like there's a strong economic drive in general to make an AI algorithms that can domain shift and work better. There's a good um, uh, Anderson Horowitz article about how AI companies tend to function a lot like services company because there's a long tail of use cases and scenarios and infinite permutations that you have to essentially uh, account for and because of that a lot of AI companies tend to fine-tune their solutions to clients and the marginal cost of, of adding each client becomes higher so it seems like if you were to make uh, models that work better in this way it would also make the economics of AI in general work better um, I guess this my intuition is to look at this as a false positive reduction problem, but I see the problem with that. It's, uh, it doesn't take into account the uh, accuracy delta that you showed, like the inner class accuracy delta. You can essentially improve the general FPR if you lower it in one dominant class. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it in the context of each class, then uh, uh, exactly. it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that's, uh, has multiple benefits, really, as you said, um, including the economy of that um, training models, creating models for um, the, t the tail end of a distribution uh, when you're deploying and applying models. Awesome. All right. There are no more questions. Uh, Chinmay, do you want to take over? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Muslim. That was a very interesting presentation. Okay, uh, and as you said, like the questions are very interesting, and if they are solved, definitely it will be very beneficial for everyone. So uh, let me start my presentation. I will share my screen. Okay. 
Yeah, can you guys see it? Yes. Awesome. So uh, today I will be presenting about a framework or a library called Onyx. Uh, in this presentation, I hope to achieve uh, that you know more about Onyx, uh, what it is, why it is useful, and how to use it. So, okay. So, what is Onyx? Now, uh, imagine you are using a deep neural network to train, train on some data. You are using a large number of GPUs or a very big cloud cluster. And now you get a trait model. So what do you do? Like now you think about inference. So what happens if the training environment differs significantly from your inference environment? For example, you train a model uh, in PyTorch, but now for inference, you want to use MXNet. To facilitate interoperability between these different frameworks, Microsoft and like many other big companies uh, started a collaboration somewhere sometime in 2017, so just a few years ago, to create a unified platform to be able to use uh, models trained on trained using different frameworks. And so, why Onyx? Uh, I answered that question very simply. But now consider you also want to run your models in a very constrained env environment like uh, say edge devices or on mobile so this is where onyx really helps you do that like you can train your model using a large number of gpus mm -hmm. it can be very big and basically you have very few constraints regarding the inference time during training but when it comes to inference you will want a model that uh, consumes less memory, uh, runs very fast, and this is where Onyx can help you. So, that this is basically the motivation for developing Onyx, and this is supported by a wide number of platforms like NVIDIA's uh, TensorRT uses Onyx to support a wide range of deep learning frameworks, Qualcomm's uh, Snapdragon neural processing engine, uh, that's an SDK uh, developed by Qualcomm. It helps you support neural network evaluation to mobile devices, and it can be used to implement inference directly into Android apps without having to rely, rely on cloud services. So this is why Onyx is a very useful tool. Uh, about using Onyx, uh, installing it is very simple. You just have to do pip install Onyx, uh, as simple as that. As for converting models to Onyx, uh, it varies from framework to framework, but most of the popular deep learning frameworks either have a way to directly export the model in Onyx format, or there are like third party libraries which help you do that. An Onyx file is basically a protobuf encoded, uh, a protobuf encoded tensor graph uh, built from Onyx operations. These operations are uh, written in C++ and there are uh, different versions for that uh, called offsets. So each runtime, like for example, uh, Qualcomm's SDK or TensorRT has to specify which offset it supports and then support those offsets completely. Like this improves compatibility across implementations. So for example, if you convert a model from PyTorch and say you specify a target offset of seven, then your runtime must support the offset seven, but if it supports eight, then your model won't work. So I've made some examples using Jupyter Notebook to convert models from popular frameworks to Onyx. And I'll briefly explain how to do that in PyTorch, Keras, or TensorFlow, and MXNet. So, uh, Onyx with TensorFlow isn't supported out of the box, and you will need a Keras to Onyx to convert a TensorFlow or Keras model to Onyx format. And uh, 
uh, vice versa to use an onyx model in tensorflow or keras you will need onyx to keras library these two libraries are also like very simple to install uh, you just have to pip install keras to onyx or pip install onyx to keras uh so converting models from keras is very simple but uh, it actually is a very messy process so uh, let's start with a resnet 50 example a uh, resnet 50 pre trained with imagenet imagenet is available in all popular frameworks so let's use that now when we load a model into keras we just have to use this command keras to onyx dot convert keras and you have to give the model the model name and the tar target offset now this target offset uh, is very peculiar like if you want to use this onyx model elsewhere you will have to make sure that wherever you want to use it supports a target offset of 10 and using the onyx checker command we can basically check that the model has been converted correctly from keras to onyx uh this is a very uh, tricky tricky case as i have found when implementing this to use an onyx model back to keras like use it in keras you will need the onyx to keras library as i mentioned previously but the thing is uh when i was implementing this the library only supported tensorflow 2.0 and above but uh, didn't support different versions of cuda and the one i had was incompatible with this with the one that i used to convert a keras model to onyx so you will have to juggle a bit to like get it in the reverse for this case like uh nazar if it's possible i i will like i would like to share the jupiter notebook as well after this presentation and like people are welcome to uh, use that to convert their models or just explore different so, sounds good please share it with me and i can forward it to sure. the meetup uh onyx with pytorch comes directly out of the box so it's very easy to do this with pytorch like you just have to specify the input shape for the model uh, give a model file name and it's as simple as torch.onyx.export model and again you can check using the onyx command whether the model has been converted correctly uh using a model using an onyx model in pytorch is a hacky way like uh, there's no support out of the box to do it but we can manually like uh, populate the weights and use the onyx model in pytorch as well uh as i ca you can see i have given a dummy input that's the same as the one in previous slide and we can check that the output shape is correct uh like for imaginate it should be 1000 pluses so moving forward with uh, mxnet uh, mxnet was the easiest uh, implementation for me to convert models to onyx and use onyx models in mxnet like there's direct out of the box support for both operations like both ways and the it's very simple to do that the only hassle with mxnet i found was that the documentation was very outdated and like updated uh, versions of onyx or mxnet uh, might also be working now so here it's also very simple like you just specify the input shape as with pytorch and just convert the model mm -hmm. also using mxnet you can just load the onyx model into mxnet you just have you just need the data names and the uh, input shape and you can just uh, use mxnet as an inference with an onyx model so these were in, uh, examples of how to convert models uh, from popular frameworks into onyx and like otherwise uh, use onyx models in popular frameworks so with all these advantages there are a few limitations uh, that are not trivial to ignore so as i said before the runtime that you are using has to support the target offset of that you use to convert the model into onyx 
uh, one more thing is uh, different frameworks are updated with uh, different like they are updated pretty quickly nowadays like new features are always coming in in later versions and they aren't in sync with their upgraded versions so a model converted from mxnet using a certain version might not work in pytorch which uses a different version and the best way to like ensure that the model works in whatever runtime or inference framework you want is to search google and see github issues like many people have faced uh, a lot of like issues but they have been solved as well so the community forum is quite strong uh, for onyx and it's more likely that you will find the answer you are looking for than not uh, one thing is that to keep in mind is to give an example of this uh, the model converted using mxnet doesn't convert the batch normalization layer properly and you have to find a way around that like there is an answer in the issues and it doesn't occur as long as you are using the same model to run inference in mxnet again but uh, those are the main points uh, i hope uh, you find it you found it useful basically uh, you can use onyx in a variety of ways and it is mostly used for inference uh, that is out of the scope of this presentation but Uh, many inference engines also support onyx like you can use a uh, tvm or ncnn and uh, a tensor rt and qualcomm's uh, np sdk to run onyx models converted from different frameworks into the hardware of your choice or using the inference framework of your choice and that's that's all from me for now and i would like questions for sure if you have them Great, thank you, Chinmay. Um, again, feel free to type any questions uh, that you may have. Um, you did mention that there's no such a thing as uh, free lunch. Um, what's what's the code base for, or what language is it written in? Is it easy to extend or modify, or to? It is so. Uh, for example, if a different layer or a different block uh, comes out, like. researchers publish a different new block uh, for a deep network it doesn't mean that onyx has to have the exact same structure so onyx uh, is written as a set of blocks like convolutional block or a pooling block and if the new block is made up of these basic structures uh, it will work in onyx but for example there comes a new activation itself uh, then you might you will have to implement it in onyx and uh, they they have a guide for that like they have a guide for contributing to onyx and it's in their it's on their github page uh, but uh, yeah mainly it's written in c++ and they also have python bindings so basically i found a blog that uh, used onyx models in 10 different languages so uh, there's no limitation for where you can use it So you're saying that new framework um, upgrades are likely to be compatible than not? Yes. Uh, okay, that's that's great. Um, so the limitations are basically things to keep in mind when converting models or when using converted models. But it's safe to assume and... that mm-hmm. if you use and we, I, we do use uh, Onyx at uh, Two Face, and I love being able to be framework agnostic. My framework of choice is PyTorch, a MaxNet for other people at the company, and it's good to have a common and friends framework that all of these uh, other frameworks, tending frameworks, can work with. But it's safe to assume that if you use it, you probably have to be pinned to a version, uh, and uh, you have to essentially. always check if the inference mm-hmm. framework supports any upgrades before you upgrade your training one uh, yeah you have to be uh, sure you have to ensure that the target offset is supported like the onyx operator set that is supported uh, the framework version doesn't matter as long as it can convert the model to the target offset like using the target offset 
like if you use a very old version of mxnet for example uh, the la- the onyx version that is supported is uh, 1.2 i think and the target offset for 1.2 uh, might have increased like uh, the target latest target offset in 1.2 might have been 4 but uh, the latest version of onyx is 1.7 and now it can be 7 or 8 so uh, that's as i said something to keep in mind like it doesn't stop you from converting the models or from using the uh, converted models great thank you chenmay that was very informative Uh, Kamal, do you want to take over? I hope I pronounce the name correctly, but uh... yeah, sure. Um, okay, so um, hi guys, I'm Kamal. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Always AI. Uh, Always AI is a computer vision company that's designed to help uh, make the process of deploying computer vision on the edge easier. So let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, sweet. So, uh computer vision on the edge, just really quickly, uh I want to I I know most of you already know what computer vision is, but I want to speak about computer vision specifically on the edge. Um and then I kind of want to chat about why we why we pick edge, what how always AI can um help optimize models on the edge. and then just kind of quickly go through a quick demo of how to deploy locally on your map. So, okay, most of you guys are already aware of what is computer vision, but I just kind of want to contextualize it. If you think about it, humans evolved to have vision uh um, maybe like millions of years ago when small organisms developed a mutation that made them sensitive to light. And today, it's the highest bandwidth sense we have. So to me, one of the most revolutionary things that engineers programmers and academics have done is have the ability to extend the functions of our visual cortex to matter and with this we can see use cases ranging anywhere from the agricultural industry to analyze grain quality all the way to healthcare to identify cancer cells some of the uh machine learning primitives that can be used to deploy computer vision on the edge will be image classification where you where the uh machine just classifies objects within an image object detection would be real time detection of objects as a video stream is coming through semantic segmentation which most of you are aware is used for autonomous vehicles which basically classifies every single pixel in an image and it's capable of labeling every object in an image that cannot be differentiated between two objects of the same class Finally there's human pose estimation which classifies various postures of the human body for gait analysis fall detection and physical therapy. So why the edge? So first just want to call out speed, right? There's uh there's a need for use cases that in- involve real-time operations where even the smallest millisecond matters. So you can think of uh robotic surgeons, right? These these surgeons need to make real-time decisions fast. Same goes for autonomous vehicles. How long are you willing to wait for a vehicle that you're sitting in that's driving autonomously to determine if the object in front of it is a ball or a child, right? So it requires fast decision making. Um that's where you would use edge. Another is it's connectivity independent. So sometimes some use cases require inferences in situations where there is limited or no internet or signal connectivity at all. So then you can think of agricultural use cases, use cases within deep space, underground, underwater, emergency services or a rescue drone that's saving surfers in the coast of Australia. All of these use cases would require the drone or um any of these any of these um edge based applications to be connectivity independent where you need not send data back to the cloud for it to be processed and then respond back and finally there is a uh, a rapidly evolving marketplace uh, so there's various different industry catalysts that are making 
edge-based inferencing easier and more affordable. So you can think of hardware innovations from uh, NVIDIA or um, even just like the Raspberry Pi and how it's like proliferating across the computer science and computer vision community. And there is optimized model architectures and software tools like ours, which I'm gonna get into next. So the Always AI platform, uh, you could start with uh, starter apps, models, and or you can build your own uh, models using our retraining services. So you could train a model, upload it to Always AI, and, and then use the rich APIs, our, our powerful abstraction layer, to extend the op application to most popular edge devices. So how it works is uh, with Always AI, you would you would pull the model from Always AI after you've uploaded it, maybe if it's your own or you're using one of the basic starter apps. And then after the authorization is complete, you will build the app on your development machine and then using Docker, deploy it to the edge. And some common use cases, I just wanna to touch on this really quickly. So I've mentioned robotic surgeons, but you can use pose estimation for fall detection so determining if like an elder elderly person has fallen and then uh, report to a, a uh, health, so, someone working in, the, in their healthcare space, uh, cancer identification, remote physical therapy, as you know, in coronavirus, we can't go anywhere. So remote physical therapy is an option here. Disease diagnostics. So in the healthcare space, there's this, there's security in smart cities, traffic management, emergency services, uh, waste management, autonomous vehicles, and then robotics and drones. So this can be applied to so many different, so many different um, industries, right? Like industrial manufacturing, home care assistance, and of course, rescue drones. So, okay, this is the point where I kind of show a live demo. Um, but before I do that, just really quickly, quickly want to highlight uh, like the four step process. Use a starter app or upload your own model. You customize and configure the apps using our abstraction layer, and then use the CLI to deploy to a workstation or a wide variety of edge devices, and optimize the model with all these AI retraining services. Now I just kind of want to go here and show you which model I want to deploy. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So let's go into object detection, um, and one of the models that I think is super, super helpful for me is um, this mobile net SSD model based off the Coco data set. And the reason why I like it is because it detects a lot of houseplants and I have lots of houseplants. <laughs> so we're gonna go into the model. And then as you can see, the commands to download the model are available here. So let's pull up a terminal. I'm gonna create a new one here just to show you guys. And then um, I'm going to go into the always AI directory. So I've created this directory. I'm just going to go in here and then we're going to go into the always AI starter app. Starter apps. And from here, you can see that all of these starter apps are available to you. Um, when you when you download the always AI starter apps. So what you would do is go into the real time object detector. And then here is where you copy the model and you paste that in here, and this will just pull the model from, from Always AI. And then the next thing you wanna do is go into your um, app.py file, so that should be saved. Um, so you, when you open this up, you can just kind of specify the model right over here. As you can see, I've already done that. So once you've done that, hit save. And then what you wanna do is from here is AAI app. So I'm doing this locally on my MacBook, so we're just going to install it here. And then AAI app start. And I hope I hope the lighting in here is okay. So I'm going to try this out. And as you can see, this can detect that I'm a person. This can detect the house plant right over here. And it can detect like my notebook. I guess it just thinks it's a book. 
but for this for this instance the macbook is considered my edge device but if i wanted to deploy it to a raspberry pi that's connected to a, a movidius neural compute stick the only thing i would change here is the engine so the engine settings would just change from dnn to dnn.openvino and if you're using a usb cam you can change the cam to one and with just a couple of these small changes you can basically swap out the hardware and and deploy it from a Raspberry Pi to a Jetson. So you could theoretically just prototype solely on your laptop and then deploy to an edge device at a later time. So yeah, um, at this point, I'm I'm open to accepting any questions. Thanks, Komal. Is it is it Komal, by the way? Yeah. What uh, you mentioned that you could upload your own models. What frameworks do you support? Yeah, great question. Um, so let me just pull that up here. Uh, so some of the frameworks we support are like TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch. At this point, we don't support a Keras model, um, but we do have professional services available to uh, to change the framework of a given model into a PyTorch model. So yeah, I hope, I hope that helps. Um, but if you wanted to upload your own model, right, like you could just go into the model catalog and spec and def define like which type of model you have. It could be an object detect detection model. You click upload models and then go from here, right? Like fill out all these details. And then from there, like that model would be available in your dashboard right over here which you can use to, to deploy to the edge. So it would be right here, my models. Okay, so if I upload a PyTorch model, for example, your platform converts it to OpenVINO if I wanna run it on a Raspberry Pi with a compute stick. And if I wanna, you said, uh, you, I saw optimizing the model in beta. Does that take place on the cloud? And, uh, so um, optimize your model with always AI retraining services. So here you could uh, you could train your own model using our services, or you could use one of the existing models and and retrain it with appropriate images. So for example, if you have if you're looking to identify a specific type of dog, for example, you could train one of the object detection models to identify that. Same goes for plants or, or vehicles, anything. Makes sense, thanks. There's a question from Sean Ma. He's asking if you've seen enterprise clients move towards edge processing and what's driving that decision? Yeah, uh, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest things actually that's driving people to go to the edge uh, beyond, just, beyond just the benefits of these use cases that I mentioned is uh, cost. So inferencing in the cloud can cost a organization anywhere from one hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's because when you I mean, if you use like a public cloud like AWS, it will charge you per minute. And if you're looking at like running a real time object detector for 20 24 hours a day, seven days a week at a train station, for example, to identify if there's any like weird, funny activities going on, um, that can add up pretty fast, right? But when you have it deployed to the edge, the edge is doing all of the processing and the computing. And of course, some of the, some of the data is being sent to the cloud for further processing, but, but for um, use cases that require like immediate notification to security for example, immediate decision making. They're using edge for those instances. Um, it makes sense. You mentioned the um, self-diving as one of the examples for edge. And I definitely see the need for a big part of that happening at the edge for connect to be connectivity independent and work offline. Uh, but one of the main examples or uh, the promises of uh, 5G uh, or one of the main use cases they tout or as that will enable self-driving cars. Have you ever been, uh, have you ever, guys ever thought about 5G or 
are you concerned about that uh, at all, for example, or do you see, because essentially the problem with Edge is you require someone to have a device or at the Edge or install a Jetson in one of the examples that you showed, and that introduces some friction. Uh, SaaS is always the easiest. You start an account, you don't need anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's not like to answer your question directly, it's not really much of a concern at this point yet. Um, only because I foresee edge computing and 5G kind of working hand to hand as opposed to one taking over the other. So I, I do see that there are, there are situations that will require immediate decision making where yes, 5G could be fast enough, but it, it, I don't see it being faster than the edge, but I could be entirely wrong about that. I do see that they would work hand in hand, like together, need not be the case that, need not be the case that um, edge, like 5G would wipe out edge. You know what I mean? Does that answer? Yeah, your definitely. It does. I, I fully agree. Uh, I think there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Yeah, um, it's from Paul Mason. He's asking, how correct is the system with identifying correct individuals in real time out in public within a crowd? Um, that's a really good question. It hasn't been tested as yet, but um, just to like, just to kind of like set expectations, we don't have facial recognition models available on our public model catalog, but you could theoretically train a model with, um, a set of few faces and train it to recognize a certain like group of people, for example, or like a certain person. So that's, that is possible. Um, in terms of being able to tell it apart in a crowd, I think it depends on like how well the model is trained. So like if you use, if you use training data that has that given person identified like in a crowd and there's like hundreds of those images, I think it'll be easier for the model. Whereas if it was just like the person and then, and then you went out to test it in a crowd, like it will not likely be super successful. Paul, I hope that answered your question. Um, Man Manuel, Manuel, he asked, do your products allow to keep a human in the loop in the decision-making process? Or are you going for fully autonomous systems? Um, so just, just to kind of like set expectations here as well, the Always AI platform is designed to help deploy computer vision on the edge. Ultimately, it's going to be the developer's decision on how they want to set it up. So if they want to keep a human being involved in the process, they could set up, they could set that up using Always AI. Whereas if they wanted a fully autonomous uh, C drone, for example, something that's like kind of operating without humans, they could do that as well. Cool. It makes sense. And um, I, yeah, uh, Manuel's question does make a lot of sense. Uh, human in the loop workflows are hand to general AI adoption. And that goes back to Ms. Alam's presentation, uh, improving uh, the performance of models in general on data they've never seen and, and scenario where the domain completely shifts uh, will definitely help with that because a big part of needing the human uh, and the loop is to validate the critical decisions that the model makes. But if you're confident about that, then you definitely need that plus. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any more questions from the group? I, I think not. Um, I just want to make a really quick announcement, if it's okay with you, Nazari. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so we're, we're hosting a webinar to show how you can retrain your own model on the 26th of August. I'll post the details in chat. So if you're interested, you can either reach out to me directly via LinkedIn or uh, just RSVP to the webinar using the link I send out in the chat. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Carmel. That was uh, very informative as well. Uh, I think I'm next. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, so my initial intention was to do a, a presentation about uh, siphonizing your Python code base.
Python is the most popular code uh, language now on GitHub, and it's a runtime language which makes which makes it kind of very difficult to to share in an offline way and and still protect it and do offline licensing. And it, it's probably a talk I will still do in the next few weeks, uh, given the fact it's very useful. But I decided to switch to slightly something a little more interesting, and it's. Uh, a new, a new workflow on face recognition that doesn't hold any uh, data on you and is completely user initiated. Uh, so we're a face recognition company. And uh, even though, yeah, we get a lot of hate because we're a face recognition company, but we pride ourselves on the responsible use of computer vision and on being a counterweight to companies that would sell the technology to anyone. Um, so that kind of helps us see ourselves a little better. Uh, I want to talk about what, what kind of concerns most people about face recognition and uh, the main aspect of it is uh, it's, it's unlike fingerprints, for example, where you have to interact with the technology, face recognition can identify you passively without interaction and in many use cases without even your consent. And uh, that definitely upsets a lot of people. Uh, the other problem is uh, people generally are uncomfortable knowing that someone holds personally identifiable information on them, uh, regardless of uh, of the type of uh, information. I think someone uh, raised their hand. I'll take a question at the end of the presentation. Apologies about that. And uh, the third aspect of it is uh, the fact that face recognition can link the the offline and online world and link you to your digital identity and online activity. A lot of people are okay with uh, being intact with cookies or first user data, but uh, uh, the moment that essentially is linked to the everyday life, it's uh, for some reason it feels more real and it's definitely a lot more of a concern. Uh, so the idea here is to use modern cryptography techniques to enable uh, a user initiated face recognition system that holds no data at all. Uh, so this is an example. In this particular case, uh, I'll take a picture of myself. I'll hit generate. And uh, what's happened now is uh, I generated a, uh, a QR code with my face in it, with my encrypted face in it. And it's a hybrid encryption process with an asymmetric component. And the asymmetric part of this encryption allows me to share the public key with anyone. I want to be able to, to create templates for my system. And um, you can think of it, the analogy I used uh, is a box. The uh, public key can essentially just lock the box and the private key can unlock it. So in this particular case, uh, you can have many enrollment uh, points of enrollment and uh, all the templates they create will essentially work with the uh, access control point that checks it, for example. So I'll go ahead and send this ID to myself. So the other point to using the asymmetric encryption in this particular example is uh, that it allows you to validate the template's authenticity and make sure that it's actually intended for the system and that you're the one that generates it. And even add features like geolocking it and tagging it to a location. So I just got my ID to my phone. I'll hit like I'll hit process ID, and uh, I'll show it my QR code. So what happened now is it read my QR code, and it's actually matching my face to the face in the QR code, and the process is uh, it decoded the QR code. Uh, decrypted my face uh, and uh, decrypted the template inside it, and now it's it's matching me to my face. And why is this? Uh, this is a flow of of how the system works. Essentially, a system can have uh, a a public. Uh, I'm sorry, a asymmetric uh, like a set of public and private keys, but it's asymmetric. Uh, part of the process. It can share the public key with any system that wants to be able to produce templates like a kiosk for enrollment or a, uh, a phone, for example. Uh, when the template is generated, we immediately encrypt it with a hybrid encryption process. And we can convert it into many formats. Uh, uh, essentially, 
we can make it a QR code, we can put it in key fobs, we can put it in NFC tags. And the challenge here was uh, if you were to take a template with a four byte float and an average size template of maybe 512 or 128 uh, like floats, for example, it's a lot of data to pack into a QR code. And the uh, C++ team has done amazing work on vector compression, quantization, and dequantization. And those techniques allowed me to actually reduce the size of the template significantly and turn it into a less uh, dense QR code, for example, that is more readable. Whereas the first time I tried this, I tried to generate QR code with the full amount of data, and it was a version 40 level QR code. And no library I used could decode it. Only one app, the actual iPhone camera could decode it. Uh, so essentially, we can put the code, uh, we can make a face into a QR code, for example, and you can communicate it to the system. The system uses the private key to decrypt it and essentially uh, ensuring the authenticity of the, of the template. And then it can match you to the face inside it. And we were partly inspired by the process of sharing your identity, the oldest way of sharing your identity with someone handing someone your ID. In this particular way, you're giving the system your ID and the system is using the security features in this particular case, modern cryptography, in the case of an old ID, the holographic or uh, whatever special prints they did to uh, make it hard to, to replicate. And that's really how this particular system works. So this system uses asymmetric encryption, but an even better approach uh, is to use uh, uh, homomorphic encryption, which essentially would just kind of skip a step. Uh, I would be able to essentially, uh, and I was hoping to make, uh, to make it use homomorphic encryption for this uh, presentation, uh, but possibly for, for another one. But essentially, uh, the a homomorphic encryption allows you to, import, to operate on encrypted data without having to decrypt it. And in this example, you can see how after the key generation and encryption process, uh, the operating on encrypted data and producing checksums, adding it and, and multiplying it. And uh, this would essentially, uh, imagine the same example I showed you, but without having to decrypt the template, you can essentially just operate on it while it's encrypted and verify and, and essentially do the same mathematical operation for similarity that we do. But why, why is, is a system like this or, or thinking in, uh, along these lines important? For one, uh, user, initiation, user initiated means that the system uh, cannot identify without your consent. It means that the system holds no, no data on you as well. And it actually prevents a lot of use cases that scare most people and that most people object to. And uh, the, the process of the modern cryptography also allows you to make sure the system is, is the template is authentic and uh, it can add a lot of uh, features as well. And uh, homomorphic encryption also can make it a lot more efficient and possibly more secure if you don't have to never uh, decrypt the data to use it. Uh, and the use cases I'd like to uh, kind of put in mind is you can essentially put a face on anything. Like you can, you can put a face on a, an ID card, for example, and uh, very often people try to use other people's ID card. Now I can essentially just scan the face on it and match you to it with a simple app. Uh, you can uh, use it, you can also put it in, uh, in, in mag steps or chips, for example, or the chip of a card, if you think about the modern credit cards. Uh, you can, as I talked, we can uh, put it in key fobs. And the way to think about this here is, uh, you can always do partial data and some, some old key fobs, for example, can hold very, very little data. Uh, you can only put a small amount of uh, bytes on it. And in that case, you can essentially split the template and uh, hold part of it and put part of it with the user. And only when the user initiates the process and communicates his part of the template, can you complete it and decrypt it and use it or use it in a homomorphic way, for example. Uh, but for example, with an access control system, it would make the keys completely not transferable. You cannot give your key to someone, you can't give uh, your access card to someone uh, for payments as well. So we can essentially 
put a face uh, in the Mac store for the chip of a card and uh, devise workflows where the cards can like match, where the systems can match you to the face in the card, for example. Or in the case of uh, uh, like fraud uh, detection or like a fraud alert, for example, it can trigger such, such, such flows. Uh, asset protection like this, for example, you can have a biometric print on any asset that you can easily, and it's, uh, it's, this is encrypted to where no one else can use it, no other system can, uh, can decode it. But essentially it would be, uh, it would tie that particular asset to a particular uh, person, for example. Uh, ticketing as well, if you think about season tickets and maybe perhaps making them non-transferable or uh, ensuring that the LA person is used in them or whatever security feature you'd like to add, uh, putting a face on the, on the ticket as well achieves all these things. Uh, and in conclusion, face recognition isn't, uh, it cannot, it doesn't, isn't only used in one way. You can imagine uh, a lot of innovative, uh, very uh, cool flows inspired by cryptography, for example, and solve a lot of the problems with, with, the, with the current uh, use of face recognition from uh, identifying without consent to holding personally identifiable data on users. And this particular simple example solves, or concept uh, uh, flow uh, solves a lot of those issues. So I'll leave uh, the mic for questions. Uh, Paul, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but I fully agree with you. Definitely using the technology without explicit consent and without uh, disclosing it uh, is, is not something we, we recommend. And it's definitely uh, against our best use guidelines. Does anyone have any other questions? Great. So I'll open it up for general Q and A to anyone uh, on the panel. Otherwise, uh, we can. I can go ahead and stop the recording. And uh, as uh, discussed previously, I'll go ahead and upload it to YouTube and share it with everyone. Yeah, Paul, I will forward your inquiry to Sean and the uh, admin side and the follow up with you about your inquiry. Thanks a lot, guys. Hope to see you at the next one. And uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists. Um, feel free to email us with any questions. And again, I'll upload the recording of the session to the Meetup page, uh, to our YouTube page, and perhaps uh, send it uh, to all the attendees as well. Uh, take care, guys, and uh, feel free to post any questions in the Meetup. Thank you, Nazari. Thanks for hosting.